Um, Lord God, I just pray for Paul. I pray for you to fill him with your Holy Spirit. Lord, let us not hear his word, Paul's words, but let us hear your words and what you've got to say to our hearts through, through him. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Well, uh, good morning to you all again, um, and it's really good to be with you, even in this very strange way. Um, uh, thank you for joining us. When you look back at history, you do see that there are times of relative plenty and security, and there are also times of deep common crisis. So a little bit of a, a kind of sweep of history. You look back even to the last century, the 20th century drawn, dawned drenched in optimism, at least in the industrial West. It was a time of steady social and technological progress. But of course, that optimism died in the trenches of the First World War. And then after a period of kind of stabilization, you had something called the Roaring Twenties, the 1920s. And again, sustained economic prosperity and of cultural development in a time of real cultural energy. But that season was followed by the Great Depression after 1929, the Wall Street crash in 1929, and the Great Depression really in the early part of the 30s, and then the Second World War. But really, in the second half of the 20th century, in the first part of the 21st, uh, we have had times that have been relatively peaceful and relatively prosperous, certainly a little bit up and down, but relatively peaceful and relatively pro prosperous overall. And recently, again, we have seen rapid technological progress, again, with the caveat that those things tend to benefit those that are already OK, you know, the global north, to use that phrase. Things still, of course, in, in our individual lives go badly wrong but we are far better protect, protected from the evil chances of life than we ever were. For instance, in the late 1950s, I think, my grandfather was treated for cancer with a groundbreaking form of therapy at the time, which we now know as radiotherapy. Now, the, uh, the treatment was still in its developmental stage, so in fact, he was badly burnt, uh, but he recovered, and uh, his cancer was cured, and he lived for another five decades. And in another time, or certainly in another place, that cancer would almost certainly have killed him. So the last 75 years have been fairly good times, at least for our society, though we would do well to remember there are others that haven't benefited in the same way. But if that's the case, it's still naive to think that there won't ever be difficult or evil times again. Those times might be times of conflict. They might be times of economic dif difficulty, and indeed of serious disease and pestilence. And of course, at this time, we're looking at the combination of those last two of economic difficulty and of disease. The social distancing measures taken in order to rightly protect life will have a serious economic effect, putting most economies into recession almost instantaneously. For some, this will result literally in famine conditions. For others, still severe economic hardship. Really, it's too early to say whether this will be something like uh, the Great Depression of the 1920s and 30s. But we do know that few people will emerge from this time better off. And our inclination during such a period could be to sort of batten down the hatches, to gather our loved ones close and try and see out the storm. That's one of the instincts that leads people to strip shelves of toilet roll, as bizarre as that has been. But I've been really encouraged, on the other hand, to see simple acts of human kindness and generosity, even on our street. Uh, kindness isn't the trademarked property of the church or of Christians. But as this situation stretches into the future, we, the church, need to step ever deeper into generosity, even if others begin to suffer from compassion fatigue. I don't want to be a Jeremiah but this is probably going to get harder a long time before it gets easier. But I want to persuade you that it's possible for us all to live in radical generosity. You don't have to be a Mother Teresa to begin to move into the radical generosity that God is calling us to live in. So two weeks ago, I talked about joy in a time of anxiety. 
last week about relationship and community in a time of isolation, and today about generosity in a time of likely scarcity. And there is a biblical model for generosity, and it's consistent throughout the whole of Scripture, Old and New Testament. If you build following this blueprint, then you will always find yourself being generous. And I've got my little prop here. I wonder if you could see it. To be honest, it is a little bit lame, and uh, you might not even be able to tell. But sacrifice plus joy over grace equals, yay, generosity. Okay, well, I'm told that's not working. But <laughs> sacrifice and uh, added to joy over grace equals generosity. So let's read together from Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 1 to 11. When you have entered the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance and have taken possession of it and settled in it, take some of the first fruits of all that you produce from the soil of the land that the Lord has given you and put them in a basket. Then go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name and say to the priest in the office at the time, in office at the time, I declare today that the Lord your God to the Lord your God, that I have come to the land the Lord swore to our ancestors to give to us. The priest shall take the basket from your hands and set it down in front of the altar of the Lord your God. Then you shall declare before the Lord your God, My father was a wandering Aramean, and he went down into Egypt with a few people and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. But the Egyptians ill-treated us and made us suffer, subjecting us to harsh labour. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our misery, toil and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now I bring the first fruits of the soil that you, Lord, have given me. Place the basket before the Lord your God and bow down before him. Then you and the Levites and the foreigners residing among you shall rejoice in all the good things that the Lord your God has given to you and to your household. This is the word of the Lord. So. Our model begins with sacrifice. Our biblical model for generosity begins with sacrifice. In Deuteronomy 26 verse 2, the people are called to give their first fruits. I don't think many of you listening to this are farmers, or maybe some of you are farmers, or maybe some of you grow food in your back garden. But you don't have to think too hard about what the first fruits are. If you're a sensible farmer, you will have several crops, perhaps, and you're, gather, you're gathering them in over a period of weeks during harvest time. And the prudent thing to do would be to <coughs> excuse me uh, would be to wait until the end of the harvest, because then you can know how much you have, and you can make a wise decision about how much you can spare. But that's not the principle. Uh, that we find in Deuteronomy. The principle is, before you even think, before you count, give. Our translation say, says that some of the first fruits should be given. In fact, the Hebrew just says the first fruits. It doesn't quite say what they'll be used for, but the implication later on is that it will benefit, benefit the Levites, that is those that saw the worship in Israel's temple, oversaw the worship in Israel's temple, and the aliens, that is those in the land who didn't have any means of support through an extended family. So basically we're talking about the church and those in need. What you give, when you give, when everything else is done with, you give the surplus. But Deuteronomy says, don't give from the surplus, give the first fruit. Before you know what you have, before you know what you've earned, before you know what the bonus is, before you know what the uh, share price is that year, give. Give, give, before you think about anything else. The issue with giving from the surplus is that sometimes there are good times and sometimes there are bad times. 
And when there isn't a great harvest, a great dividend, a great bonus that year, then we give nothing. But this approach says give riskily, give unwisely, give generously, give without counting. A generous person is a person whose approach is always to give, regardless of circumstances. Circumstances change. In good times, you might have a rich surplus. In difficult times, you might have none. But God says, give anyway. His covenant people should be willing to give whatever the conditions of the day, whether the stock market is up or down, whether consumer confidence is high or low, whether the harvest is as expected or whether it's expected to be better than expected, expected to be rich, or whether it's expected to be poor. Now, anyone in their right mind says, hold on, that is absolutely unrealistic as a model for normal generosity. That's not how we should prioritise our spending. Let me tell you about my budget, Paul. Um, first, I have a big chunky mortgage to deal with, or a lot of rent. And then I have to think about my season ticket. Have you seen how much travel season tickets cost these days? And then I have to think about utilities and then food, for goodness sake. And then a car and it's petrol and it's road tax and it's insurance. And then paying down that flipping credit card debt that's built up over time. And then, do you know what? There's life's little comforts, like a couple of beers or a coffee with a friend. And everybody deserves a decent holiday once a year, don't they? Then, before you know it, God's call to generosity has less hold on you than your subscription to Netflix. Generosity simply is a sacrificial priority or it is nothing. It's either a sacrificial priority or it's just another optional spending item on the end of the list, like that morning coffee on the way to work. Hold on, you say. Hold on, Paul. If I gave like that, then that would affect how I live. It's going to cut in. It's going to stop me doing some other stuff. And if I approach to giving to the church and those in need like that, I would have to change how I live. And I would say, yes, now you're getting it. Some people are great philanthropists because they have what they need a thousand times over. Bill and Melinda Gates have given, through their foundation, over $50 billion since they set it up. Andrew Carnegie, a great 19th century philanthropist, once offered to buy the Philippine Islands their independence. These are the people who we think of as being extraordinarily generous. But I think even if you asked them, they would say, well, it's true, I've given a lot, I gave a lot. But real generosity is when it cuts deep into your life. That's why Jesus looks at the widow putting her last penny into the collection plate and says to his disciples, look at that, that is generosity. So generosity rests in sacrifice. I hope you're enjoying this talk so far. But do you know it gets worse than that? Because not only does it rest in sacrifice, you also have to be happy about it, or at least joyful about it. So we're on to our second point now, which is joy. For generosity to be the kind of generosity that God truly desires, you have to deal with a smile on your face and a smile also in your heart. If you look at 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7, it says God loves a cheerful giver. <laughs> Notice that the giver in Deuteronomy is instructed not just to come with first fruits, not just to come with the actual gift, but with some words also. It's almost an act of worship. Then you shall declare before the Lord your God, my father was a wandering Aramean. He went down to Egypt with very few people, lived there, became a great nation. But the Egyptians ill-treated us, made us suffer, subjecting us to harsh labor. We cried out to God the God of our ancestors, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our misery and saw our toil and saw our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror and with signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land flowing with milk and honey. And now I bring the first fruits of the soil that you, Lord, have given me.
when you're bringing the first fruits, when you're bringing the gift, tell the story. We were slaves in Egypt. God came in and saved us. Everything I have is from God through grace. He put us here in this land flowing with milk and honey. Everything we have is from God through grace. And you might say, no, I've worked really hard for this. And I would say, well, with what did you work really hard for that? And you say, well, with my time and my energy and my education and the skills. And I would say, well, where did you get those from? These are all things that God has given you. So do you see what Deuteronomy is saying? There's an undergirding truth to our whole life. And this is what I was talking about in the Sermon on Joy a couple of weeks ago. We're God's covenant people and he put us here in this place of plenty. Actually, nothing I really have is mine. It's all his and he's generous with it. He's greater than whatever the circumstances are. Everything is a gift. We live in gift. We move in gift. And joy is the anchor that holds us to generosity. It isn't happiness because happiness is based on circumstances. But joy is the posture of our hearts to life when we know that the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the faithful one is for us. God loves a cheerful giver because a cheerful giver is deeply connected to the truth of God's goodness. So Jesus says in Matthew chapter six, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And essentially he's saying this, if you want to know where someone's heart is, then follow the money. And for each of us, there's something that we don't think twice about being ridiculously extravagant on. Something that others look on and they're puzzled and confused by. Why did you spend so much on that thing? In my final university, I met a very good friend and someone who's still a friend uh, today. Uh, his name was Nick. His name really was Nick. And he was so obsessed about improving the quality of the sound on his music system that he spent his student loan on gold-plated speaker cables and other accessories. Why? He couldn't, have, he couldn't even afford to go to the supermarket, but he had these things, um, gold-plated speaker cables. And maybe you're the kind of person that wants to buy an Arsenal season ticket for 1,800 quid. And I'm like, why? I mean, why would you do that? But it might not be a hobby. Some people pour everything they have into their children or into a cause or into a business that's never really going to make them lots of money. But they do it for joy and they do it for love. A friend uh, was telling me recently about someone they were working with on a cap course. This person was a Christian, but they were in deep debt. They never gave a penny into the collection plate because their finances were in such a mess. But there was a whole lot of spending three or four nights a week, every week, going out with his friends for meals, for drinks. No matter how tight things were, he always said yes to that. It was what he most wanted, really. What he most craved, really, was an escape from loneliness. And that's where his heart took him. Not that he could fill that hole by doing those things. But when you're working out of a place of joy, you'll want to give. The kind of generosity we're talking about will hurt your budget. But it won't hurt your heart. It will hurt your budget but it won't hurt your heart. So we have a sacrificial approach, a joyful approach. But do you know sacrifice isn't enough? Because we might think that we're putting God in our debt and God says, no man is my debtor. And joy isn't enough alone because let's face it, none of us are born with that sense of joy and attachment to the cause of Christ, attachment to the kingdom that we're willing to give extravagantly and generously for it. So we need a final ingredient and that is grace. So we pay attention to the story uh, that the giver in Deuteronomy tells. It's about the escape from Egypt. You can read it in Exodus or watch The Prince of Egypt on your Disney Plus subscription. Go for it. But the people are saved by God from Egypt. And on that last night in Egypt, they're told, like we're told these days, to stay in your homes and then do a very, very strange, a very odd thing. Sacrifice a lamp, uh, a lamp, <laughs> a lamb, 
and take the blood of the lamb and spread it over your doorposts. And when the angel of death passes through that land, that blood will protect you and your family. And the angel passes through the land and all the other families lose their firstborn. And I have to say, what a terrible story. Even the guy in Deuteronomy says it. Terrible deeds God did to release us from Egypt. We'll talk about that another time. But what do you think they were saying as they were walking out of Egypt? I think they were saying, hey, Mo, what was it about those fluffy little lambs that kept us safe? And Mo says, I'm, I'm just not sure. Um, you know, God told us to do it. They don't know. They don't know what it is about the lamb that sheds its blood that keeps them safe. How could they? But we know. We know which lamb shed his blood for our sake. And John the Baptist says when he sees Jesus approaching, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John looked at Jesus and saw that he was the one who would give everything in a profound and ultimate act of grace. Jesus had everything taken. His last possession, his robe, was gambled for and before the cross, it was taken away from him. Did he give sacrificially? Yes. He became a sacrifice for sins, not just gave sacrificially. He became a sacrifice. Did he give joyfully? Yes, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Now we are called to the point where it changes our lives. We're called to generosity to the point where it changes our lives. He gave so generously that he lost his life. So when we're captured by that picture of grace, when we're captured by the person of Jesus and what he does for us, then something changes, something flips. And here's the thing. When I talk about generosity, you might wonder that I'm talking about tithing to the church. I'm not talking about tithing to the church. I'm talking about something much more than that. I'm talking about your whole life. And when you see that grace, when you feel that grace, you will sail past 10% without even noticing. Think of those examples from the life of Jesus. Think of Mary coming to Jesus with this jar of expensive perfume and just smashing it open and spilling it all over his feet. And everybody around is looking at that extravagance and saying, this is ridiculous. This money could be put to so much better use. Why are you doing that? And think of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, who's called down from the tree, who meets with the grace of Jesus. Everybody else has rejected him. Everybody else has excluded him. Everybody else has said, no, Zacchaeus, you're a kind of filthy collaborator. But Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to eat in your home. And so captured is he by the grace of God that he says, I'm going to give away 50% of all I have. And if I've cheated anybody, I'll pay them back three or four times. Or think of the Macedonian church you read about in 2 Corinthians 8. You know that Paul in that letter is writing to a church in Corinth and drawing his attention to the church in Macedonia. And he says, now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches in the midst of very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. And it's all there. Sacrifice amidst poverty, joy grace well up in rich generosity but it begins with grace paul says they gave themselves first to the lord their hearts were captured by him they gave themselves first to the lord and then everything else followed for you know church in corinth the grace of our lord jesus christ that though he was rich Yet for your sake, he became poor, so that through his poverty, you might become rich. So, you know, Paul is writing to a very impressive church. They're a great church. They have revivals spilling out all over the place. They have spiritual gifts. They have great teachers. They have great children's work. They're a destination church. They're a mega church in a wealthy city, the city of Corinth, in the center of the known world. And Paul says, you're excelling in so much. 
You're so good. You're so impressive. But look at this poor little church, this poor and pressed community out there on the fringe, on the margins of the empire. You look and you learn from them. See that you also excel in this grace of giving. Generosity isn't about how impressive the whole thing looks. It's about your heart that you give first to the Lord. In Deuteronomy, of course, it says at the end of the verses which we read, that tithing for the Levite and for the alien, that giving to support the spiritual ministry of God's people and to support the poor, it produces joy, it produces thanksgiving. And there's this amazing picture that Christian generosity can see money transformed from a false idol to a means of grace. What do I mean by that? It will be a means. Our generosity will be a means through which people encounter God. Others will rejoice at our generosity and then look to God and say, thank you, God. A few years ago, of course, in a very different time, we collected money together as a church to uh, support Syrian refugees who were on the migrant uh, route from Syria across the Mediterranean through Greece and so on. And uh, that was a long and interesting story. And I must share it with you sometime about how we eventually kind of found a home for that money. It wasn't easy to spend it in many ways. But the result was, of course, uh, a moment, a single moment where Becca went to the airport to welcome the first family, who we now are so close with, with, with such good friends with them. And the first moment she met the mother of that family, that lady said to Becca, you are my sister. And in a way, all who gave then, all who gave so generously then, were a brother and a sister to her. Now that was just probably for most of us, maybe it cut in a little bit, maybe not even at all, maybe we didn't even notice when that donation left the bank. But the more we do that, then the more the kingdom economy will take hold in this time of scarcity. Jesus Christ gave the biggest gift, the biggest imaginable gift. The Son of God gave up his life. Now that has changed billions of lives. That is the effect of that gift. Billions more lives in the future will be changed by that. So I say to you, it is truly more joyful to give than to receive. There are two things I want to say just to close. The first is, stay tuned. We're going to get really practical as a church on how to be generous during this time. It's not a normal time. And we're going to have to be creative and we're going to have to be thoughtful about how can we connect the resources that we have to need. But we are going to model ourselves on the Macedonian church. We are not going to model ourselves on the Corinthian church. We're not going to admire cleverness. We're not going to admire kind of great reputation. We're not going to, we're not going to model ourselves on that. We're going to model ourselves on the Macedonian church who gave when it was difficult, who gave when it was really cutting in, when they were hard pressed, they were in a time of trial. They gave sacrificially, they gave with joy, and they gave because they had first given themselves to God. We're going to model ourselves on the Macedonian church. And then finally, I want to say, if you have never received the gift that Jesus offers in his life, his death, his resurrection, if you've never been brought, invited even, into the family of God, to receive everything that he has to give you, then there's an opportunity for you to do that now. All you need to do is open your hands and say, thank you, Jesus. What you give, I receive.
Lord, help me to give what I have in response. My heart is won by your grace, won by your goodness. Let me receive you now. Amen. That is the end of today's lesson. If you were someone watching who prayed that prayer, then get in touch with us. And we would want to take the next steps of that journey with you. For now, uh, let me finish it again in prayer. Just bless you as you go to your weeks. Remember that we have the Zoom meeting that I've slightly overrun and is now just starting. So let me finish in prayer now. Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for technology. We thank you that um, uh, it has enabled us to worship together in some fashion. Thank you that uh, your word has been spoken. Lord, I pray that everything that you want to say to us, it will go down deep and it will take hold of our hearts uh, and take hold of our lives. Lord, anything that I have said, Lord, may it just uh, fall away. Lord, be with us this week. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. See you later, guys. <laughs>